Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Joe. Did you hear that all the way back? I want you new people to hear this, because I got it all put together, and you haven't. In the few minutes that I have left, we'll talk a little bit about alcoholism and not alcoholism. Uh, it's a very present thing. I'm thrilled to death to be here, and Casper, and, and I went to the first two meetings here, and finally they called on a scrubby-looking old guy named Bob, and... It was the first man that we had talked from up behind this podium. I thought you had nothing but women in AA up here until that time. And I'm thrilled to death to see it. I really am. I never am, uh, failed to be awe-inspired standing in front of a group of alcoholics and, uh, the people who have recovered against the awesome odds that are against us, against any recovery from this illness. Now, I started laughing in AA many years ago, and I think the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous was based upon a very desperate sense of humor, and I've enjoyed laughing ever since I've come to AA. Some people have said that I may take the program a little lightly, but I have taken it up until today for, and I'll tell you this for two reasons. I've been sober for 40 days and 31 years today. So, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons that I told you. The other reason is for the newcomer to assure you that Alcoholics Anonymous is way beyond the experimental stages by far. And I would love to say to you newcomers that you're embarking upon probably the greatest adventure that you'll ever have in your lifetime, believe me. And to you, my hat is off. Now, I see a lot of old-timers around here. Most old AA members are pain in the... <laughs> I like to think I'm an exception to that rule. I'm just a kind old man, clean old man. And uh, I like to think that this is uh, alcoholism, a very strange disease. This is the only disease known to mankind where the newcomer apologizes for not having it longer. <laughs> when he comes to AA. But society, society labors with a misapprehension that if we can just explain alcoholism well enough, the drunk will quit drinking. They do. They have films and tons of paper and uh, seminars, everything. But the funny thing is, the drunk is never there. <laughs> Only sober people see the films and the literature. <laughs> the drunk is right around through that door over on the other side. Of the... What I'm trying to say to you, if you approach the alcoholic ever... You will have to visit him in his natural habitat. <laughs> because he's not going to look at those films under any stretch of the imagination. And if you read a pamphlet to him over the foot of the bed, you better be quick or he'll puke on you. <laughs> and sometimes I think we get carried away with our own rhetoric, you know. I tried everything for my alcoholism, and I'd love to say here today that uh, I tried religion, and Alcoholics Anonymous is not a religion, believe me. Sometimes I wish that it were. Then I could shout and promise my way into sobriety, and I wouldn't have to work those damn steps. <laughs> I tried uh, psychiatry. 
for a mild heart problem, and I discovered that psychiatry is the art of picking the pocket through the scalp. <laughs> I studied everything that Freud ever wrote. I was, I'm an authority on Sigmund Freud. He was a pet of mine. And I just believed everything that he said until I found out that he didn't have any willpower, and then I let him go. <laughs> Freud couldn't quit smoking. He died of throat cancer after 39 operations. Can't hear you. You can't hear me. What part do you want me to go over? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bill. It's all right with me. Is that any better? These things are kind of like an old barroom spittoon. If you don't get the proper aim on them, you can make a hell of a mess. I'm <laughs> You may be sorry that you asked for the correction. <laughs> Where was it with Freud? My God. He wrote a thing, Freud did. Uh, one of his last dissertations, and I hope I don't offend any Alamans here, in his wrote the last dissertation that Freud ever wrote was a little thing uh, called A Question of Lay Analysis. And he said, now Sigmund said this, I didn't, so don't blame me with it. He said, anybody that would treat anybody else for an emotional problem that they had not experienced themselves should be arrested. Don't hurt AA much, but it sure raises hell to hell and on. <laughs> you know, at the, at the expense of being sarcastic, and I never am, there's a lot of difference between sharing your experience and imposing your opinion on somebody. I just thought I'd throw that in for, you know. I, I tried uh, yoga, all oh, the meditation of yoga, and I studied Emmanuel Kant and Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche, just doing real good, until I got to the part where you stand on your head and all of my pills fell out of my pocket. <laughs> I think I'm very similar to a lot of people here. I tried everything to quit drinking, but quit drinking. That I couldn't quite get the hang of. This seems to be a great drawback with some of us coming to AA now. They come to meetings, and they can do everything, memorize the steps, and give a fine spiritual talk, but they can't get the hang of not drinking. And this is one of the more important things, I think. <laughs> I was at a seminar the other day, and a psychiatrist asked me a question, a hell of a question, and it's hard to answer. He said, Mr. Lee, what's the difference between a non-alcoholic and an alcoholic? Oh, God, that'll work you for a long time. And after three or four minutes, I came up to him and I said, You know, I believe that alcoholics drink more than non-alcoholics. <laughs> and he, he said to me, he was undaunted, whatever that means. He said, Well, why is it that when non-alcoholics drink, they don't become alcoholics. And I said, that's easy. They don't have any willpower. <laughs> you got to be gutsy to get where we are. <laughs> I don't know about that thing. The kids, the hot cat, that are coming out of the 60s now, seem to get hung up on a great question. Every one of them say, oh, I must identify. Gotta identify. Let me break some news to you. 
If you identify and still don't find a way to work this program, you can die identified. <laughs> Your tombstone will read, Here lies an identified alcoholic. <laughs> but for those of you who just absolutely have to identify, maybe we can do something about it. Years ago in general service, they had a pamphlet, one of the tons of pamphlets, and this pamphlet was under heading. They still have it, incidentally. It was 44 questions. And these were little innocuous questions. You know, little questions that didn't quite fit my type of alcoholism. They, Some of them were, oh, did your wife give you that look today? Or did you gargle with too much lavores? Or some, you know. Now, out of my sheer brilliance, I have devised some questions that I think it'll take less than 44 for you to identify. Have you ever had the roof of your mouth sunburn? <laughs> Have you, have you ever been arrested while in jail? <laughs> have you ever been run over by your own car while driving? <laughs> Here's a very untidy one. Have you ever had malfunction of the zipper? <laughs> They used to call me Rusty. <laughs> Have you ever woke up in bed with a circus midget in bed? Not for me. While I'm mentioning, did you hear about that midget that was thrown out of the nudist colony because he was going around getting his nose in everybody's business? <laughs> My gosh, I, I think we're identifying here. <laughs> Has your, has your Alaron ever dropped a hot electric card in the bathtub with you? <laughs> I think we, we've gone nearly far enough. I'll give you the last question. Have you ever woke up in the morning with the brown whimpers <laughs> and, and lose your glasses and wash your teeth with preparation A? <laughs> That knows that I'll give you a pucker. I, I think we can identify here with some of you people. I think if that's your problem, we've taken care of that. I really do. But you know, it's an amazing thing about the alcoholic. He's always the last one to know. He don't want to come there. This was the last place with a bunch of dull, coffee-drinking, cake-eating people like you. You're really a bunch of dullards to me, you know. And I wouldn't have come unless for one reason, that's out of desperation. I had tried everything else before I tried you. This is the last song. I took my first drink when I was 17 years old, purely and simply to be accepted in a group of boys. That night, I remember those other six fellows that drank with me that night. Some of them are still in that nebulous realm of social drinking. Some of them are dead. But that night, that drink, 
did something to me that it did not do to those other six fellows. I have no explanation for it. I only remember the euphoria of it. The few short minutes of this great, can you describe it? This great euphoria, this great thing. I think if I were to try to tell you what that drink did to me that night, I would have to say to you I experienced a few short minutes of omnipotence. I believe that. Well, it wasn't compulsive, neither was it obsessive. But I went back to it again and again, just for that few short minutes. Our book tells us, the book, if I mention the book tonight, it'll be the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a big blue one. And <laughs> that big. But our book tells us that the alcoholic cannot remember the pain of even a week ago. He can blot out the memory of the most desperate circumstance. And I started going back to it again and again, chasing that elusive euphoria for the next 19 and a half years. And that's just generally the whole story. And I went to it again and again. We were last week, Bill and I were in Wichita. Dear Eve, who came out of general service, she's 37 years sober now. One of the greatest things that she said last week was, don't worry too much in judging an alcoholic what alcohol does to him. But be mighty careful when you find out what it does for him. This is the hazard of alcoholism to us. That drink did something for me that I still can't explain. I got two things out of drinking. One was sophistication and the other was intellectuality. Oh, God, I just blossomed out like that. <laughs> came away from the wall, and the little hick town that I lived in immediately became too small for me. And I went out to the lands of fruits and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up, of all places, in Hollywood, California. And I chose for my profession, if you please, and I hate to use this word, I can use it if I'm not in California, a very queer profession. I became an understudy to one of the more eminent designers of ladies' lingerie. Had a golden opportunity, a fine Jewish fellow took me in. And I became an understudy to a fellow at that time by name Kurtzman, who was dead and gone these many years. He was quite the thing then. I'll let my ego blossom out a little bit. In the year 1938, we put the first pair of slacks on a gal called Marlena Dietrich and started a trend that I see here today that never has gone away in this business. It was a wonderful opportunity. It was the greatest opportunity that I ever had. In fact, uh, to be very frank with you, I've got a wonderful future behind me. <laughs> This is where you cut these soft, silk, sleazy, intimate things that the ladies wear. Now, we've got a step in AA, the came to believe step, where it infers that you might have a gopher in the garden. If you cut a bunch of brassieres with three of those places in them, you're nuts. <laughs> and I told a psychiatrist about that, and he said it was just wishful thinking. Needless to say, I cut myself out of that profession. There's no question about it. This was the great opportunity, the first hurt, the first humiliation. This fine Jewish fellow had taken me in, a country clod from East Texas, and spent a bundle of money on me. And people who watched me work said that I would go far in that industry, and I did, far away. He came to me one morning and told me a thing that an alcoholic cannot stand to hear. We can't stand this. He said to me, Joe, you can't drink. That was it. Now, we can't stand that. We can't stand can't or don't. An alcoholic cannot live with those two words. Just recently, I was up in the University of Illinois, 
making a talk up there to those professors in a place about like this. And I was talking, and I looked over on the wall, and there was a sign over there about like that coffee and tea thing. And that sign said, don't. And I'd talk a little while, and I, my head went right back to that don't over there. I just couldn't stand it. And it said, don't take the dishes out of this hall. <laughs> I got two of them damn dishes at home now. They, they have absolutely no collectible value. But they said to me, don't take the dishes. He said to me, you can't drink. And I set out to prove that I could and prove that I could not, which is the case with most of us. And he came to me one morning, and he was a rather whimsical fellow. He said to me one morning, good morning, Joe, you're fired. <laughs> Brevity was a thing with him, you know, perfectly good humored. And then he said a thing to me, he said, I've all, I, there's always something good comes out of everything. And I thought, what the hell are you talking about? I'm getting a sack here. And then he said, the way you handle those scissors, if you'd have been a rabbi, you'd have destroyed our whole race. <laughs> First job. First hurt, first humiliation, first indignity. This is the beginning of this thing called alcoholism. And it seems to me that as we go along, we're looking for a why and a because. We've got to tell people why it's happening to us. It drives us crazy. And we lay in bed at night and devise Many answers, none of them satisfying us. People say, how come you got fired, Joe? You know what they said. We devised something that was all out of proportion. The war was going on at that time, and I went and bought a plumber's license out the back door of a union hall in San Pedro. Take good green money for it. And I went into the shipyard as a master plumber. Uh, here's a fellow that had never picked up anything any heavier than a pair of scissors. And you know I was a master fraud. You know that very well. Then those were the days when they, here it comes again, you're, we were frozen to our job. Did anybody remember those hellish days when you, what are they saying to me? You can't quit, they're saying to me. I have a pink document that hangs in my den today, and it's signed by the United States Department of War Labor, and it prohibits me from working within 25 miles of the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> Who can't quit? And then somewhere along here... We say to the dear Alanon, let's go somewhere else. Let's move. This is the beginning. In fact, incidentally, the treatment for our illness, this has been the only treatment for alcoholism up until the advent of this society. Keep him moving, keep him moving, keep him moving. No family likes to admit they got one of us. <laughs> Even yet. You know, around the bridge tables, a girl will say, what's that noise I hear in the back room? Oh, that's my son. He's an alcoholic, you know. <laughs> you don't hear that at all. So we say to the dear Alan, um, let's go somewhere where nobody, where we don't know anybody. What we're saying is where nobody knows us. And we move from Los Angeles to Sacramento, and I hear people standing up here behind this podium. Sometimes it gets competitive with these horrible things that have happened to us. Really, it does. And they, you know, it does. It gets competitive. I can win the contest hands down right here. When I got to Sacramento, I was run over by the welcome wagon. 
And it seems to me another thing about we smart alcoholics with the keen mind, it seems that the things that we can do, the choices become less and less and less. And we take the next best thing. But the arrow always points down. You ever seen those, you remember the old arrows in the liquor stores down in the south? I don't know whether you have them here or not. But that arrow always points down. That's where all the good stuff is. There ain't a damn thing up here, you know. But this is the story of an alcoholic. My choices of things became less and less and less. Promising myself, like most of us, tomorrow is going to be different. Tomorrow will be better. Things are going to start looking up for me, you know. And that proves the absolute stupidity of the alcoholic. We get up in the morning and do the same thing and expect a different result. Don't we? Today it's going to be different. I never have been to a seminar where they discuss the keen alcoholic mind. You only hear about that in AA. So of all the places I had to go, I went to work on the railroad. And I have a very humble opinion about those people. They're the most narrow-minded people I believe I've ever met. They have a rule about drinking. And it reads that if you're seen coming out of a place that dispenses alcoholic beverages, you can be fired. And I wasn't seen coming out very often. <laughs> If I was, I was an unidentified flying object. You know. <laughs> and I'm sure that they had good reason for having those rules. I'm sure they did. They ran more than one train on the track, even though I never did find out how they did it. And uh, they uh, just didn't approve of people drinking. I suppose they felt that if a man was idle, he'd mix them up. And that's just exactly what I did. <laughs> we in Sacramento, those of you who have never been out in that country, maybe you can follow the parlance, the vernacular of this railroad, but we went up to 7,000 feet from sea level in a distance of 90 miles. This is the roughest piece of railroad in the world, believe me. We used to use a lot of helper engines pushing the trains up to the top. And you don't need the helper engines going down the other side, so you cut them off and send them back. And you do this great move in a thing that they call an interlocking system. Great, beautiful uh, electronic device built by the Sperry Company. And uh, the railroad had the unmitigated effrontery, that's a good word, to hang a sign in their depot in Sacramento with regards to this interlocking system. Now, I know you're going to like this. You're going to be crazy about this one. They said in that sign, it is physically impossible <laughs> to make a mistake in that interlocking system. <laughs> I like that, don't you? Man, that kind of kept me going. I'd just go a block out of the way and walk through the depot to stand there and read that sign. <laughs> it is physically impossible to make a mistake up there. Oh, God, it just I could see that sign in my sleep at night, you know. It, well, one night, <laughs> I got two engines going towards one another. Between them were four cars, carrots, apples, lettuce, and celery, and I made the biggest Waldorf salad in history. <laughs> and, and to say the least, the, the railroad was real upset. They, they wanted to fire me for that. And railroads have investigations, and I had another alcoholic representing me at this investigation. And he proved one of the most atrocious lies that's ever been devised. 
something about a Mexican track walker swinging a lantern and that I had mistaken his lantern for a signal. I never did find the Mexican. <laughs> but, but they gave me 60 days. After the investigation, the old superintendent came out of there and he was livid with rage. He was a big man. And he was so mad that he didn't know what to do. It wasn't the fact that I had destroyed hundreds of thousand dollars worth of equipment. It was the fact that I screwed up their sign. This is what they... <laughs> and I think he kind of knew that he had been had by a drunk. I really do think he knew that. And oh, he was mad. Oh, I've never seen a man quite so upset as him. And he said to me, you ought to be arrested for even walking on our right of way. And then he said something to me that Alanons have been heard to say to their dear husbands, I'll get you if it's the last thing I ever do. <laughs> Did you know that you don't have to get even with an alcoholic? Did you know that? If left to his own devices, there is a thing inside of him that unless by some good fortune he can fall into the hands of AA, he'll get even with himself. You don't have to get even with an alcoholic. And there is nothing that you can call him or say to him that he hasn't already cried in the pillow at night. He's ahead of you, way ahead of you, for getting even. This is the state of the alcoholic. Nobody knows. And the only truth that he'll tell during this whole course is when he sits on the bar stool and tells the bartender, nobody understands me. This is the only truth that he can utter, and he does that by rote. Nobody understands me. This is the plight of the alcoholic, and the arrow only points down. The physical body will take so much, and I ended up being shipped to a railroad hospital in San Francisco and gotten down. The story, you hear people talk about the wine drinkers and the winos. The story of drinking wine is never a long one. It's a fast ride. It comes at the end, but it is a merciless killing, if you believe me. It is a merciless killing. And I've gotten on wine, as I like to say, quite by accident. Aren't we the ones to make it sound good, you know? Swept into it, innocently enough, I was. But one day I couldn't take my breakfast. And I went into a bar where a little Irish bartender had catered to my wants for a long time. It was the only place I had left where there was credit. And I said to him, Curly, I can't take my breakfast. And he said, over behind the bar, he was mopping. He was outside the bar, and he was mopping. He said, over behind the bar is a quart of port wine, and uh, you can take a drink of that and then go back to whiskey. And I've got to say here to you, my friends, I have never been back to whiskey. I like wine. I like what it does to you. It's easy to get down. And some of the fantastic dreams are even greater than that of the pure alcoholic. People cut wine so much, you know, but it has some great medicinal purposes. <laughs> wine will cure hay fever. And the doctors have been trying it for years, you know. Wine will cure it instantly. If you drink it that, like I did, you're not about to sneeze. I'll tell you that for sure. Huh? She knows. It's a hell of a fast ride. Then I got to where I used to have a lot of company that my wife couldn't see. <laughs> You know, hi, John, and drive her crazy. No wonder. I, I feel terribly sorry for Alanons for having put up with us like they have. I think they're 
uh, patience is beyond any reason, and I tip my hat to anybody that comes to AA with that old gal still hanging on his arm. God bless him, and do anything you want to. I've got a lot of patience with you for that. But the alcoholic and his delirium, and they carted me off to the railroad hospital in San Francisco, it took me into <laughs> it. was a funny thing, if you look back on it, like most things are. The guy took me out of the, my apartment in Sacramento and put me in an ambulance. And we went to San Francisco making 80 miles an hour with the siren screaming and the red lights flashing. Here's a guy who been drunk 17 years and they're in a hurry to do something about it, you know. <laughs> And I'm I'm laying up in the back of the ambulance and and, and and winking at people when I go by, you know, through the window. And when I got to the hospital, it was two days before I saw a doctor. Big hurry. I guess they were out testing cigarettes or something. And they put me in there. And this was my introduction to psychiatry and uh, the members of Alcoholics Anonymous of my acquaintance who have had their alcoholism beaten out of them through their knees with a rubber mallet are very few. In fact, they count them on that finger. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that one, I don't know. <laughs> but they brought in this frustrated piano tuner. <laughs> and he asked me a lot of silly questions. And I gave him a lot of brilliant answers. If, he, if he's not a rummy now, it's not my fault. I, I'll tell you. Little old nasty personal question. Did you ever wet the bed? Well, I know that's a result of drinking and not a cause of it. Yeah. I've... <laughs> I've killed more potted plants than bad weather, you know. Huh? Used to, used to go to parties in Hollywood. I was a queer for palms. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they ask you terrible questions. One of them asked me, did you ever suck your thumb? And I remember how pale he took, looked when I told him, yeah, I still do, you know. <laughs> And I graphically, I graphically described to him how I went off in the corner to relax and take a quick pull at my thumb. <laughs> well, you can laugh if you want to. It relaxes me. <laughs> never would come to see me anymore. I don't know why. Okay. They dumped me out of that hospital. This was before the days of alcoholism. We knew about rhinos, but we never had heard the word alcoholism. And they threw me out of that hospital. Doctor came to me one day and said, you got to get out of here and let some sick people come in. I've been going around cheering up some of the patients, and they've been, you know, bad deal. And I did the only thing that I know to do. When I was a kid, all of my life, any time I got into trouble, when I had a big drinking spree, anywhere, anytime, I did one thing. I always went home to Mama. Mama had a good purse, and she had a good place to get sober. And she was very tolerant of me up to a certain point. And I always went home to Mama. I had a delightful childhood. It lasted 37 years. <laughs> and when they bumped me out of that hospital, I went home to Mama. This one was already gone. She had left me 
prior to that time. And I say that without any rancor, for God's sake, because there is a limit to what anybody can take. And if I ever abused anybody, and I think that's a good word, I did her. She was already gone. You were already gone. And here I am, the smart guy from Hollywood in Beverly Hills, the resourceful man who knew all the answers, walking home to Mama at the age of 37. Now, this is exactly the reversal of the story of the prodigal son. They saw him coming from afar and threw his butt in jail. <laughs> I was a very lean calf that they killed that time. Maybe it won't be so funny from here on out. Maybe we'll do a little thing called revisiting the 12th step of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the step that put us into action many, many years ago, and it is the step that has kept us in perpetuity until now. So maybe it won't be so funny from here on in. I'm in jail, hating my own mother for having brought this great humiliation down upon me. It wasn't my first jail, nor will I. But somehow or other, it was particularly cutting. And one Monday morning, there came a fellow to my cell and asked for me by name. And if you don't remember anything else I say here tonight from this podium, I want you to remember one word. He came unsolicited. <laughs> if you dummies had had to wait for me to call you, I might have had to die. And this guy came of his own volition, gave me the pitch of Alcoholics Anonymous that we know so well looking through those vertical Venetian blinds. Now, there's been a great misapprehension about some things in Alcoholics Anonymous, and if a drunk says something for three days and nobody argues with him, it becomes a law. Isn't that right? In AA, you know, one of us comes up with a cutie. I think most cliches are devised to make disaster more palatable. If anything ever kills us, it'll be distraught cliché. We have read a thing here a while ago in our tradition, and it reads, our public relations policy is based upon attraction rather than promotion. That's well and good and true. But that's our public relations policy. That's how we deal with those dummies out there. Our staying alive policy is not that. Our staying alive policy is based upon the first paragraph in Chapter 7 of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and it will tell you why that man came to see me. People get the misapprehension that we go to see alcoholics because they're alcoholics. We go to see alcoholics because we're alcoholics. That was taken care of in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in 1935 when Bill was very distraught and he said these words. Suddenly I discovered that I needed him more than he needed me. This is the reason that we go. This fellow had read his lessons and he had read them well. And the first paragraph reads like this. Practical experience shows us that the surest immunity, and that's what we came here for, the surest immunity against drinking, against drinking, is intensive work with other alcoholics. Then he makes you a promise and says, this work, when all other activities fail. When your prayer group blows it, when your transcendental meditation group blows it,
when you're sitting and touching the group blows it. <laughs> this works when all other activities fail. This guy had read that. He knew what it meant and was living the program. He didn't come to the jail to see me. He came to see somebody. And that's the reason that we go, and sometimes unsolicited. And the next sentence reads like this, and I hope it doesn't need any interpreting. Carry this message to the other alcoholics, exclamation mark in the book. Is that clear? How are you going to screw that one up? <laughs> You ought to have a seminar about that one. <laughs> you ought to subject that one to an in-depth study. Carry this message to the other alcoholic. He gave me the pitch and I didn't want it. He was kind of, oh, he was a dullard, a dum-dum, really. And he stood there and kept repeating, we have found from our experience. Prefaced everything that he said to me that morning. And I thought, oh, my God, he's like a Victrola record. Will you go away? Get away from here. And I was too deep in the shell to take it. But he gave me the whole pitch. And I submit to you that maybe the reason I stand here today is because I couldn't make that guy react. I cut him and I did everything and he stood oh so still. We have found from our experience. <laughs> and I'm going to honestly say that he left. That from that day until the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I could not erase that man from in front of me. Oh, he left. He put his address on a little pamphlet. We didn't have a whole bunch in those days. We had one. This pamphlet was written by two losers of which we have many in the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was written by a doctor who died drunk and a pill head that I saw the other day flapping around on his ankles. <clears throat> Slaves of drink, fine peace of mind. He put his name and his address on it, and unconcerned, <clears throat> as if he had been waiting for a stoplight, he looked over his shoulder and said to me, if you ever need us, call us. And with that, he went. He had done his job. Now I'm going to say something to you, and I hope to God you don't think it's preaching. But in the good old days of AA, we used to talk about something that you don't hear about now. And that's called planting the seed of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because we're not hurry. We're not in any hurry in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I say this. Without any fear of contradiction, it has not been less than a year ago that a guy come wandering into my AA group who I had gone to see 23 years ago. And it took him 23 years to come. And this guy walked out, but he had planted the seed, if you please. And I don't know whether he reported to my people or not, but my people were good substantial citizens down in there, and they paid two deputy sheriffs to load me into a police car, wouldn't let me come home to say goodbye, sent my bags down to the jail, and they carried me 200 miles to Houston and put me on a train going west. But this is what we euphemistically talk about in Al-Anon as releasing him with love. <laughs> And they carried me off of that wheelchair in Los Angeles. I'd kind of set up shop in one of the toilets, and <laughs> some smart aleck said, we got to use this car, you can't live in it. And when I got up to walk, I couldn't. They carried me out in the wheelchair, if you know the old station. I was down there the other day with Clancy, and we had a good cry right where they dumped me. <clears throat> but all the jocular remarks that I might make and all the fun that we have in looking back at the ridiculous antics of an alcoholic 
Let me say to you that for the next five months I lived in hell. I drank as few people have and lived to tell the story. I ended up under the bridge in Sacramento. And I shall now say to you, there is no way to get from under the bridge in Sacramento to Casper, Wyoming, except by the grace of God. That's all. And sometimes we want to make great big deals over our spiritual experiences, and sometimes we think that we're obligated to spell them out and describe them to somebody else. And our program is so gentle that we are relieved of that obligation. We don't have to talk about it if we don't want to. And it's ours, and there's not another one like it. And the come to believe step, in step two, Bill writes in there with regards to us. And I shall read it to you per se. After being relieved of their alcoholic obsession, they were unaccountably their lives were unaccountably transformed. And they were able to believe in a power greater than themselves. And some of them even talked about God. That's in the study of the second step of the come to believe. Why do you suppose he put unaccountably in there? He could have well said their lives were transformed. He meant that it was an unaccountable situation that we were renewed blind and had no explanation of it. It was the result of some things that had happened to us. He put unaccountably in there for the same reason that way over here in the 11th step, he put conscious contact. Now we've come this far, and we're able to realize what is happening to us. And the greatest thing that we don't learn in AA is that the third step is not the spiritual awakening step. The spiritual awakening step is in step 12, and it is followed by five magic words in this society. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. A lot of misapprehensions about the history of this society, and if you study chapter 1 in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, you labor with the misapprehension that Bill had a hot flash, that's what he used to call it, spiritual experience, real hot flash. And if you go back and read chapter 1 in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, you will find out that he did what we know now is 12 of the steps before he ever had it. There ain't no free lunch in AA. Believe me, there's not. One night, out there, I did the thing that it takes to get in this society. That and nothing more. Nothing elaborate. I fell. I, I had already gone to my knees from alcohol. And I think I fell the rest of the way. And I said, God help me. And no more than that. And I suspect that's all that's necessary. I got up and crawled out of that flop house and walked 2,600 miles back to Tyler, Texas, to where that fellow had given me that damn pamphlet. It was a hard trip. It was a pathetic trip. It was a suffering trip. How would you like to find out? I've been in AA for about three weeks, and this will blow you to pieces. I'd been in AA for about three weeks when I found out that there was an AA group three blocks from that damn bridge. <laughs> we're smart. Oh, we're smart. That'll tell your story all the pieces, you know. Story of pathos and tragedy. Well, I gotta get well pretty soon.
And I went back before that fellow had given me that pamphlet, and he carried me to my first AA meeting, and I've had to compare all other AA meetings with that one. That was my night. <clears throat> and I say to the newcomers here, I hope you have your night. And that it means as much to you as it did to me. They carried me up some old diagonal-looking stairs in a dark second story that night. In those days, they were all upstairs. <clears throat> and I remember going into this group of people. And in our little blue pamphlet, a member's eye view of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I think is a must with us everywhere. I knew the author of that. He was a friend of mine, little Alan McGinnis. He's dead now. And he described his first entrance into an AA meeting, and he said this, I was thrust into a group of people completely devoid of personality. And that was what happened to me that night. I couldn't see any personalities, but I could see the eyes. And that night I became we. And I don't remember any of the profundities that the old-timers shot at me that night. I remember experiencing, shall we say, a communication that night, and it would be something like this if I tried to visually describe it. Here are some people like me, and the sickening loneliness I suspect that hangs with every drunk, as long as he stays out there and sucks on the neck of that bottle, left me that night. I have not been lonely since that night. My life has never been the same since that night that I made my first AA meeting into an atmosphere completely devoid of personality. I was. And over to me, over to one side, during the meeting, there sat the old Sherry who had locked me up in his jail years previous to that for felonious drunk driving. Here he was that night with his pistol still on the very symbol of everything that I hated. He was a man who was known for brutality. He would bounce prisoners off of the wall of his jail, a very, very mean man. He sat in AA that night, sober. I'd been gone for 20 years, and after the meeting he came up and probably transmitted, is that the word we have in our book, transmitted the essence of this society, he put his arm around me, and he said, I love you. And you can make this thing just like I do. What is the transmittal of a feeling like that? The absolute essence of understanding. There's a priest one time who said that it is a much greater feat to jog the understanding than it is to jog the memory. But that night, they did their job and they did it well. And I think that if there is, a responsibility involved in the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know there are only a few. I think the responsibility is what we show that guy the first night he comes. We do not know by what circuitous route he has come. We don't know how many years it has taken him to make that trip that night. But whatever you do that night, good or bad, when he leaves, to him that's Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you do your job well, you may get a dummy like me to stay. Over to one side of me sat a fellow that liked to drove me crazy during the meeting. He was gently puffing on a cigar, and he had on a big diamond ring, and he had one of these serenity things that some of us seem to get. <laughs> and he liked to drove me out of my mind. I knew I knew him, but I was still kind of fogged up. I was on a, you know, eating a few bean of barbs and drinking a little gallo and letting them run concurrently. <laughs> and my eyes wouldn't focus too well. After the meeting, I discovered that I had soldiered with this fellow many years prior to that time. And the last time I had seen him, he was chained to a post in an army camp. And that was the army's treatment for alcoholism in those days. We used to slip him whiskey just to watch him perform with that chain. <laughs> he was a dummy. A comedian, if you ever saw one, a pure nut. And here he sat in an AA group that night, gently puffing on the cigar, the big diamond ring, and the serenity pouch here he got on the front of it. And you know what my first reaction was? 
I looked at him and I said, if it'll do him that much, it'll make a damn genius out of me. You know that. <laughs> I don't know how to get down from here. Let's get to something that's in a foreign land. Let's talk about coming to believe. We'll take it out of another book, maybe, out the, besides the big book. This is the story of a nut, a fellow sick like me, just like me. It's a story that's in the scripture that some of you will become familiar with, and I'm going to have to tell it to you like I read it, like my warped mind read it. This is a story in the scripture of the demoniac. Most of you have learned it at your mother's knee. This was a story about a guy, they called him a maniac full of demons, that's all, you know, they didn't have psychiatry in those days. If we'd have had him now, he'd have been a bedwetter, catatonic, or something like that. But for the lack of better verbiage, they called this poor sick nut a demoniac. And the story goes, and it says that he was so wild that no man could tame him, like me said that the manifestation of his disease was such that they had to keep him in fetters and chains like me. And finally it said that the progression of his illness, as I see it, he got so bad that they had to run him out of town like me. He ended up on the riverbank, or maybe under the bridge, eating with the pigs, like me. If your imagination is half as good as mine, you can see the perfect picture of the babble, the tail, and even the smell of this. The poor sick nut eating with the pig. And there seemed to have been at that time a little carpenter fellow going around teaching some new philosophy of love. And he had a facility that we have not quite acquired in Alcoholics Anonymous yet. <laughs> He could see no ill in anyone. And he says to the nut, Are you having some trouble? Just like the fellow said to me in jail. And the fellow in his step pity said to the little carpenter, Trouble is my name. They call me Legion, which means many. And the little carpenter didn't say to him, Are you ready? <laughs> He effected a treatment that was as little understood in those days as some of the mechanics of Alcoholics Anonymous are today. It had to do with casting the evil spirits out of this crazy nut. And they went into some pigs, and if you know the story, the pigs were crazed and went off and jumped in the sea. And that's not the end of the story. In those days, the pig business was big business. And there were some stool pigeons around, like there always is. And the stool pigeons went into town to tell the people that owned the pigs. They said to them, you out of the pig business. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine what their reaction was when they found out that they were out of business. And the story goes that they went in mass see what had happened. And here's the story of the second step in Alcoholics Anonymous. When they got there, there he sat, fully clothed and in his right mind. What have we got? Come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Same thing. And these people were real in sin. They were mad that they'd been put out of the pig business. They were more interested in the loss of their pigs than they were in the fact that one feller got well. And this is what this perpetuation of the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous hangs upon, is that one feller gets well. How many of you folks came in a bunch? <laughs> <laughs> and they said to him, get out, get out, you've caused us enough trouble. And they were really mad. And I can see the nut. 
in his terror and timidity, having come from the terror of one life and not having had a chance to enjoy the fruits of another. And he turned to the little carpenter and he said to him, let me go with you. The little carpenter broke a rule for us. Everybody that he'd ever helped up until that time, he had said to them, go on and don't say anything about it. You were blind and now you see it. He told them, be quiet, don't say anything. He said to the nut, what I could well say to you as members of Alcoholics Anonymous, he said, stay here so that others can see what has happened to you. Thank you so very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.